But I found this years ago when we're doing uh, camp ministry. It says it fills our life with purpose. And it brightens all our days. It lifts our eyes toward heaven. And gives God all the praise. Let us heed the glad tidings of wisdom. Revealed through this heavenly store. With faith that's prevailing. And love that's unfailing. May we trust in its promise of life evermore. Therefore think on it carefully. And study it prayerfully. Deep in your heart let its oracles dwell. Now ponder its mystery. And slight not its history. None can e'er love it too fondly or well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege tonight to be with these dear ones. We pray if there's anyone here tonight, Father, that has never trusted in what you did for them through the cross work of Jesus Christ, that even they take this opportunity just now to, to believe in that, to receive that by faith, trusting that you have accomplished all that ever needs to be done for them to take care of everything that's wrong with us, having paid that sin debt to give us eternal life, Inheritance in heavenly places and an eternal relationship with you. And for all these wonderful things, we thank you in the precious and matchless name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm glad that you have your good copies of the book there with you. I'm going to run you through a lot of scriptures because I didn't, I didn't take time to, to list them all here, so we'll use your Bibles tonight. But it's, uh, I taught it the conflict of the ages. And uh, give you some word of caution here. The thing that Christians do so much is they anticipate revelation. My brother mentioned that this morning. Uh, don't do that. When you study through the Bible, go back and, and I, I love history. And when I, th when I study the Bible or anything, when I go see something of a historical nature, I try to imagine in my mind, what was that really like back there? What were those people doing? I saw Custer's Gauntlets one time in a museum out west. I'm going, there was a real guy named George Armstrong. His, his hand was in that thing. I try, I try to imagine all that stuff. I take my back in time and not try to impose 21st century culture, morality, and ethics on 200 years ago. See? You have to do the same thing with the Bible. Uh, God revealed those, uh, these, these truths back there from about 2000 B.C. to about 70 A.D., okay? Uh, not 1980, not 2023, okay? So you have to be careful of that. So as you begin to study the, uh, God's purpose for mankind in the earth, uh, in accordance with his prophetic purpose, you approach that from a viewpoint when these events are happening during this time in history under the culture and environment that biblical writers believe in. You're, you're going to see things because we're going to take you back there when they were living in this and what they believed and understood, you know. Yeah, and it's like I, I, heard, I heard an old radio preacher one time said, if this book was good enough for Moses, it's good enough for me. Well, guess what? He didn't have that book, you know. <laughs> You know, and I, but, but, but I'm telling you, not he, but they believe that. They believe this has always been around, and Moses had the same information. No, he didn't. And, you know, when you, when you think back historically like that, you think back even in the, into the Acts period and so forth, the apostles. Now, there were letters starting to be circulated, and, and people understood something. Most people couldn't even read. Yeah. Most, people, didn't have a, people didn't have a Bible. You take the children of Israel coming through the wilderness of Moses. Moses wrote it. How many of them had a copy? Only the, the kings were supposed to write themselves a copy. And the priests had, had you know, superintendents of it. But the people didn't. You know, why the, you know the reason why people got so in trouble and went south as far as worshiping other gods and so forth? Because their leaders did. Yeah. You know, the leadership over those people caused their failure. Amen. And so that's, uh, that's what's happening back there. I'm getting off on stuff I shouldn't talk about yet. All right. Now, all right. Uh, goal. Uh, gives some representative insight regarding the great conflict uh, the, uh, with an ancient adversary, okay? The serpent, he's called. And so he, he, he's in opposition to God's purpose for mankind on the earth. And in doing so, you're going to hopefully better understand the passage of Scripture that the church has traditionally dismissed as too supernatural and therefore outside the scope of a sect of church theology. That's what I said before. They've downplayed this to a great degree. So that all Christianity is about even if you're evangelistic, you know, is to get people saved. Yeah. And hopefully they live a nice, quiet, gentle, peaceful, moral, upstanding life and wait to die to go to heaven. Yeah. It's just like a lady in my church told me one time. He says, he says Pastor, what most people is really interested just marry us and bury us and leave us alone in the middle. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know? And, and they never grow and they never go anywhere. It's like my dad used to say. They sit on the stool of do nothing for their whole Christian experience. Yeah, you know? ne never doing anything for the cause of Christ through their life. 
See? Never talking about what justice is about, about allowing the glory and, and grace and majesty and joy and peace and all those attributes of Christ to shine and be manifest through their mortal flesh. That's what we're here for, you see. And so uh, we approach this topic to help you avoid the often faulty viewpoints that have been passed down by early church men and their dogma and modernists of our day who disdain the plain sense of Scripture in favor of science, falsely so-called. Science meaning knowledge. Okay. Just, just, a bunch of, just a bunch of false stuff to cover up things that you don't want to believe in. Okay. And so next one is... And we probably looked at these. Christian history is not the context of the biblical writers. Yeah. Christian history has only been around since, you know, the early days of Paul. Uh, the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, wasn't it? Yeah. But not before that. See? So you can't do that. The Bible descends to us, I told you, from about 2070 A.D. The creeds, confessions, philosophical influence of Greek and Latin so-called church fathers are no substitute for the biblical text. Amen. Do not get me started on the early church fathers. <laughs> yeah. If you don't know where all this Calvinism and, and all these other weird things come from, its, its roots are in Augustine. Yeah. Augustinian nutcase job. But, 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 but anyway, yeah, i, I got to calm down and just uh, go to the next slide. Uh, let's begin at the end. <laughs> this is one. Of, this is one. Of, let's begin at the end. Okay, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself, what that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in Him. Amen. Well, why does He have to gather it back together in one? Because it's been busted up and taken apart and usurped by, by that ancient adversary, okay? And so, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you people have this information already in, under your hat, and, uh, and I'll go through it quickly, but I don't want to rush through it either. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's those two places, see? God has a vested interest in two places, heaven and earth. Uh, through the satanic rebellion in the invisible and visible realms, God's authority was usurped. Now, I won't get into all this thing of when, when that rebellion of Satan took place. Uh, as far as I'm it had to happen for me sometime between Genesis 1, 1, and 2. Amen. And that, that's, people, they have different opinions on that. But somewhere, sometime, somehow, that guy rebelled against God. Okay? And, and you studied Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. I know you've done that at church. I've heard Paul teach on these things. But the Bible reveals to us the divine account of the reconciliation. See, that's where we, we begin at the end. He's going to reconcile those things, those places that have been usurped and, ta and taken, taken captive He's going to, in heaven and in earth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, you're going to find out as we study through this, uh, Israel couldn't be what they needed to be as God's imagers. We, we could, man has always been a failure, you know. Uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a risk. I think I put this later on. There's a risk when he gave his beings that he created free will. But he was ready for that. <laughs> you know? But Colossians 1.20, having made peace through how? The blood of his cross by him to do what? Reconcile all things to himself. By him I say where there be things where? Earth and heaven. Two places, okay? Now, let's get this up here. The big picture, and you guys know this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. And so you've got, you've got before he creates anything, mm -hmm. he's there, you know. Did he need anything? Not really, you know. But apparently he desired some things for himself, yeah. and so he makes them. You know, he creates these things. Colossians 1, and, 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 and the things he creates are, are in the visible and invisible realm, okay? Go over to Colossians real quick. You've got your Bibles, let's use them a little bit. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. Now, this stuff really, uh, when I began to study this a few years ago, I said, man, this stuff is exciting. You know, the Christian life for so many people, because, because it's all there is, just do well in the middle between the two ends, it becomes a, a thing, and they'll tell you it's boring. Christianity is boring. And my little, that little girl in Sunday school, they were there, and, and that little boy was making a fuss. She said, shh, be quiet. She says, it's boring. And she poked and said, it's supposed to be boring. You shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not supposed to be boring. You know? <laughs> Colossians 1, 16 and 17. 
For by him, the Lord Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and earth, and visible and invisible, and watch this now, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him, okay? And he's before all things, and by him all things consist. What did he make? He made a hierarchical governing structure in those places, okay? But principalities and powers and thrones and dominions, those are places of ruling authority there, see? Uh, God is a God of order and decency and so forth. So when he created these people, these beings in the invisible realm and eventually humans in the earthly realm, they're there for a purpose. Now keep that word in mind because here we come. This is God's will and purpose for populating and governing both these realms through sons uh, as fully participating imagers. That's what he created, fully participating imagers of himself, of himself, Okay. And uh, prior to the Most High God creating the visible physical realm, which, you know, that's what we experience through our five senses and so forth, and before he made man, he had already made a family of non-human beings which occupied the unseen invisible realm. Okay? Job 38, 47. Go there. Job 38. Job 38. Verse 4. Job 38. Again, I'll try to, not to go fast, but I'll try to use our time wisely here, and I'll give you time to, to turn to the pages. It's nice to hear the leaves to the pages turning out there. <laughs> I, remember, I remember one time years ago, I was teaching an adult Sunday school class, and uh, I wanted to give a real quick synopsis to get to where I wanted to go. I was in the Acts, book of Acts, and I was going... Yeah, the day of Pentecost and everything, Peter's preaching there and everything, you know, in Acts chapter 5, they asked Sapphire and everything. We go over there in Acts chapter 7, and I get the, 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 the unpardonable sin and so forth, and uh, with Stephen being stoned and everything. I was up to like Acts chapter 13, and the lady's back going, What? What, Ruth? Who's Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and so you assume people know stuff, and a lot of times they don't. So 38 and chapter, chapter 38 and verse 4. Interesting passage. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You got something going on in the invisible realm. Beings there who are shouting for joy and singing and so forth before the visible realm is created, right? All right. Next one. God has many sons. Remember? Uh, he, he has sons to be participating imagers. He has many sons. Adam was a created son of God. I often point that out to people a lot of times when, when they'll quote uh, John 3.16 out of a different version because the different verse say his only son. Yeah. For God so he gave his only son. And, I, and I'll say, can I ask you a question? But does God have only one son? Huh? <laughs> they looked at you like, what? And I, does he have only one son? Well, yeah, I guess. I'm going to start listing them off. I said, uh, I, I, you ever read genealogy in Luke? It takes it all the way back to Adam. Da -da 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 -da, and Adam, the son of God. Okay? Israel is God's son. So that's, he's, he's my firstborn. Okay? Uh, members of the body of Christ. Is here talking about is our, our sons, okay? Uh, as noted in the, uh, here in, in this passage, the heavenly hosts are identified as sons of God, okay? And I always note this with folks, but there is only one begotten son. I didn't, I didn't know what that meant for years. I thought that's talking about his birth, about the nativity. And that's what it means in most cases. So-and-so begat, so-and-so, so this guy begat, this, you know. Uh, go, over, go over to Genesis. I'm going to take time and do this for some of you may not have had to study this before. Go to Genesis 22 and then grab Hebrews 11. Genesis 22 and then Hebrews 11. Compare these two scriptures. Hebrews 11 and Genesis 22. Of course, Genesis 22 is the familiar account with Abraham having God instruct him to come and offer his son, you know. 
And we get over here in chapter 22. And what have I got? Verse 2 there for you. Yeah. And you got your place in, in Hebrews 11. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, so on and so forth. Did, did Abraham at this point, did he have only one son? No. Yeah. No, yeah. No, yeah. He had one that was, he had one that was uh, four, what, 14 or 16 years older than Isaac. He had Ishmael. So he's got more than one. But there's only one that counts. <laughs> okay. You will see that. Now, now I go over and compare this. The, the Bible is such a wonderful book. You know, it helps you figure out things that you, you scratch your head over. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse, uh, was it 22? No, 17. 17. Yeah. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten, begotten son. Hmm. What's that mean? That he gave birth to him? Well, it can't mean that because Ishmael is a begotten son too, yeah. from that from that definition. Okay, so he said, "Take your only begotten son." Go to Psalm two, and on your way back there, grab Acts thirteen. Psalm two, and Acts thirteen. You could also you can also reference if you're taking notes. You can reference Hebrews chapter one five and five five. I believe quotes this uh, psalm that we're going to look at. Acts chapter 13, verse 33, hold your place there, and then grab Psalms chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. Okay, now let's look at Psalm first, Psalm chapter 2 first, and got that place in Acts. Ready? All right. Chapter 2, Psalm verse 7. I will declare the decree... The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Have I begotten thee? Well, that's not talking about his birth through Mary. What's it talking about? When did he beget him? When, this day I begot. He's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it, brother. Okay. And Hebrews 1 5, 5 5, repeat that too. And now here's Paul in chapter 13 of 33, if you're still over there. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, that he raised up. So you, 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 you figure out what this is all about. And that he raised up Jesus again, as it is written in the second psalm that we just read. Thou art my son this day, have I begotten thee. See? Not nativity, you know, not through the sea of the woman thing. The resurrection. See? Uh, w- without a risen Christ. This is another religious book. Amen. Right. Amen. You know, you know. That's it. And you're going to find out that though the death paid the penalty, if it stayed in the grave, it wouldn't amount to anything. Amen. See? Right. Amen. You have. To, I asked people something. I said, you know, I, I said, you know why Jesus Christ, the God Man, the Man, you know why He had to die, so He could raise again. Yeah. 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 He has to die first. To rise again. And in rising, there's where, he, there's where he gains all ultimate victory in this reconciliation process. Amen. See? See? And, and, and it's not just you that are reconciled, okay? The heaven and earth is also reconciled, and all those principalities and governmental places are reconciled by the risen Jesus. See? Yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, if you get that, yeah. if you get that, and go in there with understanding that and go study your Bible. Amen. It's going, man, I'm getting goosebumps. You know, it's exciting. Amen. Right. It's ex- Amen. This is not a boring life. Do you, do you know who you are? Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, you're a son of God, yes. having an inheritance there in the heavenly places, mirror of the body of Christ. I'm getting, I'm getting to tomorrow summer. I don't care. The, 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 you're a, you're a, do you know how, how much of a unique species of human being you are as a member of the body of Christ? Amen. You aren't supposed to be there. Right. He, right. Made, he made Adam for the earth. Yeah. And unbeknownst to everybody else, even Satan, he kept a little something behind. And, and you understand this. Before the foundation of the world, he had the body of Christ in mind already to do what? To reconcile the heavenly places. Amen. But he didn't, he didn't let anybody know about that one. Yeah. He broadcast the earth thing and letting Satan know about it. And the coolest thing about that, he just kind of feeds some more rope out each time. You know, he did something. 
So at the end, he hung himself. By what? The resurrection. Amen. It's like when he died. Oh, I got him. And it's, and it's like God goes. Mm. <laughs> that little something here, you know, that I didn't tell you about. You know? And so, but it's, I mean, that stuff just, it gives me goosebumps, man, Amen. to think about that. I, I cry over stuff like that. Amen. But, uh, yeah, but the, where were we? Yeah, the only begotten. There's only one begotten son, but he has many other sons. Yeah. See? God, God's a loving father, and he, and he has a purpose for his sons. We're going we're to look at that, too. Okay, here, here's your two realms. We've talked about that, invisible and invisible. The sons of God in both places, imagers in both places. Well, let's define what it means to be an imager. Now, this is interesting. I just stumbled on this the last little while. Because when I think about, well, I'll ask you. We, we, we as believers, in the Bible, we, we believe that life is sacred. That's why we're against abortion and all that kind of thing, right? What does it mean to be made in the image and likeness of God? To be sentient beings, to have consciousness, to uh, be able to pray and commune with God. That's, that's, that's what I always thought. Quality characteristics and attributes, right? Does a conceptus have that? Four, five, six little cells? Is, is, it, is it aware? Does it pray? No, it, it, it don't. So it doesn't have the image of God from that standpoint, from that definition, Right? I mean, I mean, if, if, you get, if you get somebody that's really uh, looked at this in, this in this fashion, and when you say we're made in the image of God, and you start listing off a bunch of qualities and attributes and characteristics that, have, that God has, you know, he can say, well, wait a minute. That four or five cell creature, we, life begins at conception, right? Well, it doesn't have that quality. And then somebody else, some Christian say, yeah, but it will be. It's got the potential to be that. Oh, well, fine. Until it reaches that point. Then what's the problem with aborting a baby? Logically, there is none. But that's not what being made in the image and likeness of God is all about. Now, obviously, those things are going to be ours. Okay, those qualities and characteristics we're going to be. We're going to have the image. But the but the bottom line emphasis this issue of the the image of God, it's a status issue. The image of life is sacred to God. Human life is sacred to God. He made Adam because he had a purpose. For man, okay, it's all about purpose that he has. So even if it's a four or five cell conceptus, or a 90 year old with Alzheimer's that can't even think no more, the life is sacred because God has a, a, a status type purpose for mankind. Okay, when He made that's that's the dominion mandate. He didn't he didn't he didn't create Adam just for nothing. He, he created him to be that, that king of the earth, a co-ruler, a regent there in the earth, and, and had the dominion in the earth. Gave him a purpose, see? To what? To what end? To the praise of the glory of God, see? And so when you begin when to think about that thing about what it means to an imager, and his sons are to be imagers in the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, it's regard to the purpose that God has for them according to his good pleasure, Amen. okay? That's what that's all about. Now, are these other things, uh, are, are they the likeness and so forth of God? Sure they are. Those characteristics are there. But again, think about that argument I just gave to you. Uh, a, a sharp abortionist will, will take you to lunch on that. Right. Unless you understand that the image of God. So your life is sacred in Christ because there's a purpose for it. Yeah. Okay? A purpose ordained by God. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where were we? And I talked about it. Let's, let's move on so we don't waste so much time. Participatory imagers. God's will and desire to accomplish his purpose in conjunction with these imagers he has made. And so let me, oh, th th these are really cool. Uh, let me give you a couple examples here on how God is pleased to, to uh, rule and reign in concert with others. Okay. Go to 2 Kings. And then we'll go to Daniel. Uh, 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 22. This is a really interesting uh, Scenario, if you will, here it's an account that goes back with the with King Ahab and these people. But uh, First Kings chapter twenty-two. First Kings twenty-two, verse sixteen. Yeah, we got plenty of time. All right. First Kings chapter twenty-two, beginning with verse sixteen. If you're familiar with the account here, uh, this is where. Uh, 
Ahab wants uh, uh, Jehoshaphat to come up and help him go against these other, this other king up there in Ramoth Gilead. Verse 16. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee to tell? What happened was, uh, John, he says, I'll bring all my, uh, he said, well, we've, got to, we've got to ask the Lord if it's a good day to go to war. And uh, he's got these people under his thumb. They say, Oh, yeah, good day, you have victory and all this kind of thing. And he says, Was well, there anybody else we can ask? And so, verse 16, they call on Micaiah. Micaiah is this other guy, and uh, Ahab hates him because he always prophesies against him. Okay? And so verse 16, the king said, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? <laughs> I told you he'd do this. And, he, and then he says, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. So you're in the throne room. And all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. What's the, what saying have you got? In your imagination, what are you seeing there? Here's, here's, here's the most high God sitting on his throne. And he's got an entourage around him on both sides. So there's a council there or, or a group of people, a congregation, if you want an assembly. All right? And so the Lord said... Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? I'm sick of this guy. It's time to get rid of him. Okay? How are we going to do that? And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. Who said on this manner and that manner? Who said? These, 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 these congregation of people that are there, these beings that are there, okay? And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. I got an idea, okay? And the Lord said unto him, Well, wherewith? And he said, I'll go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him from your fail. Go forth and do so. Now watch the next verse. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. So who did it? They did. <laughs> the Lord did. The Spirit did. They both did. Okay. You see, you see that? That's, that's how God is pleased to it's, we're not. He said, when I, when I talk about embryos being having a purpose, we're not automatons. God, he didn't create robots to just manipulate and have a little game going on with. There's issues there where he's pleased to, to, to uh, commiserate and communicate and talk these things over with, with his congregation. What is true in the invisible realm, in this case, is true also in the earthly realm. See? So look at, look at Daniel chapter 4. Go to Daniel chapter 4. You see, you see the same issues here with these spiritual beings in, in the invisible realm. Daniel chapter 4. And again, I, I trust that uh, uh, some of you in here are, are aware of some of these things. I know this has been preached to you, but it's good to review these things, isn't it? Daniel chapter 4, verse 13. I saw, in the, uh, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from where? Heaven. From heaven. Okay. This is not an earthly being. Okay. He cried aloud and said, hew down the trees, so on and so forth. Now you get down to verse 17. This matter is by the decree of God. Well, I'm waiting. It's by the decree of the watchers. What they're going to do, you know, he says, this is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom. And he's going to prove to him it's the Most High God, not Baal, not, not the gods of, of Babylon or anything. It's the Most High God who rules in the affairs of men. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that, guys? You know? Well, the watchers have a decree. That'll cause it to happen. Mm -hmm. And he giveth it to whomsoever he will and set up over the most high of, of men. The dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. He, th he thinks that his, his false gods are in him. 
and you've got the watchers that are associated with God up here. Now look at verse uh, chapter 10, verse 12, or 23, rather, I'm sorry, uh, verse 23. 23 in the same chapter. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, hew the tree down, so on and so forth. Now look at chapter, uh, verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. This is the decree of the... Huh. I thought it was the decree of the watchers. And now it's the decree of the Most High. Okay. Who's who, who doing it? They are. <laughs> you get, are you getting this? Okay. Look at, look at chapter 10 and we'll move on. Chapter 10, verse 12. Chapter 10, verse 12. Think of the invisible realm here, what goes on in these places. Just as real, uh, just as real as the visible realm, uh, of places both where God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who we read over in Colossians a minute ago, he created both places, filled them with, filled them with the same things, principalities and powers, thrones and dominions. So there's things going on there. Chapter 10, verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. Who's the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Well, it's not somebody on the earth that this guy is contending with. It's somebody in the invisible realm. It's somebody in that heavenly place where these heavenly hosts reside, these other sons of God and so forth. And there's good ones there, and there's some bad ones there. You know, And so that's what's going on in those places. So, so hopefully that will shape our understanding now that we jump down here and go back to Genesis again and see how that happens, what takes place in the garden. Okay, So let's look at that. Go to... Oh, let me give you this first. This is important. Go to, go to Psalm 82. Go to Psalm 82. Yeah. Who are the Elohim? That word Elohim is an interesting Hebrew word which is translated God or gods, we're going to see. Psalm chapter 82. Psalm 82. Everybody there? God, Elohim, standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, Elohim. Big G God, little G gods. They're both Elohim. Okay? They, they, they both exist in the unseen realm. But there's only one most high God. There is only one begotten son. There's only one most high Elohim. But there are many other Elohim, okay? And uh, so we don't run out of time. Let me run over here. And anybody need to write any of those down? Uh, 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 chapter eight. Go, go, to, go to 89 real quick. Go to chapter 89, verse 5 in Psalm 1. We're close. Let me show you something there. I hate to rush through these, but we'll run out of time here if we don't. Chapter 89, and look at, oh, this, yeah, this is neat. Chapter 89, verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Now, beloved, again, we're not talking about a meeting down here in the earth. There's a congregation of saints, holy ones, in the heavenly realm. Okay? For who in the heaven, see, that's, that's where, that's where it's, who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Capital O, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the word for Jehovah. Okay. It's also a, a, a word that is, is conjoined with the, uh, the pre incarnate Christ. Okay. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Where's that at? It's in the invisible realm. This, this assembly, this congregation is there. And to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? So again, the whole point with these, uh, with these references I had here, which we can't have, don't have time to go through all of them, but that, that issue of Elohim, let me see if that's the next one. Uh, yeah, right here. Devils are demons. That's sometimes translated from the word Elohim. Disembodied human did, did remember, remember the issue with King Saul when he went to the, the necromancer, the witch, and had, uh, had him raise up Samuel? Samuel's an Elohim. You know why? 
because Elohim is just a general term that refers to residents of the invisible realm, disembodied spiritual realm, not a term describing equivalent attributes. There's none like God, big G God, but they all exist in that same realm, see? Even Samuel. That makes sense? Yes. All right, all right. Let's move on then. Congregation of the Saints, that's what we just read about those and so forth. Who am I, we, and and that's, that's, the, that's the verse we just read, so we don't need to go over that. Uh, God and the gods. The ancient adversary. Oh, this is interesting too. Go back to Job with me, chapter 38. Job 38. Job 38. Are you guys doing okay? I know, I know this is a lot of material. I mean, uh, I, when, when I, I called or texted Paul one day, I said, Paul, have you ever felt overprepared and underprepared at the same time? <laughs> and, and man, you know, it, it's just overwhelming, some of this stuff. But uh, chapter 38, verse 6, I got there, right? Verse 6. Oh, and that, that's the one we looked at. That's, no, 6 through 12, okay. Whereupon the foundations there are fastened, who laid the cornerstone uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Uh, I don't know why I've got this in here. Oh, I know, I know where I'm at. I got the wrong, I got the wrong reference there for you. Go back to the first chapter. Go back to the first chapter of Job. I'll have to correct that when I... Now there's a day, verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Remember that phrase? I, I, I hope I get to that later about walking up and down the earth and going to and fro in it. Uh, th that's an issue where it's mine. I possess it. You ever buy a place and everything? What do you do? Walk in it. Walk in, check it out. Survey it. Look and see what you got, right? That's, well, that comes up again with Abraham and so forth. When he gives him the land, he says, now go out and walk up and down here. It's your possession. Okay. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's war language, brother. Because <laughs> somebody's already been walking up and down in it. And he thinks it's his. And God says, Abraham, you go walk up and down in it. Amen. <laughs> you know, so. But anyway, then Satan answers him. Lord said, uh, Doth Job fear God for naught? Verse 9, verse 10. Hast thought thou made a hedge about him, about his house, and about all that had blessed on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and such substance has increased, so on and so forth. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all he hath, and he'll curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto, unto Satan, Behold, all he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth his hand. So Satan went forth in the, from the presence of the Lord. You know what just happened there? I, you know, the book of Job, about patience and, you know, how he survived and everything, all that, and he lost everything, got all back. And that, that's the Sunday school story. You know what just happened there? He questioned God's authority. He said, uh, does he fear you for not? Yeah, he's a righteous man. He'll, he'll do just fine. God, God knows that Job's not going to fail, but Satan just tested and, 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 and basically spoke against his word and his authority. He challenged that, see? Go on, go on and do that. See, and so why does he take? Why does he have to take everything from him? At the end, he takes everything from him, even his health and everything. And his wife's saying, "Curse God and die, man." You know, why does he take it right down to nothing? Because in the end, it'll prove not only just that Satan was wrong; it'll prove to everybody amongst the congregation of the saints that God knew what he was talking about. Challenge accepted, victory gained, okay? You know? You know? Good. I mean, you know, he, he, he got him again. He got him again. You know, a, a brother years ago keyed me into something that always stuck with me. He says, you know, people think there was a power struggle between God and Satan when he said, I'll be like the most high. He says, there's never been about a power struggle. Satan's never been more powerful than God and never will be. It's an issue of a wisdom struggle. He thought he's just a smart, a smart ass, see? And he, and he gets trapped and caught up in his own wisdom, see? 
I can do this. <laughs> we had, we had, I, I, was, I was in the nuclear navy, and I wasn't on subs, but any of you familiar with uh, Admiral Rickover? You ever heard the name Admiral Rickover? He was the father of the nuclear navy. The Nautilus was the first nuclear submarine. And so he knew everything there was to know about anything about a nuclear ship, the engineering space, everything. He could, he could stand a watch on anything. And so the joke was always, uh, uh, well, how'd that go? Uh, uh, Admiral Rickover's not God, but he's qualified to stand the watch. <laughs> I mean, you know exhibit how smart that guy was. Well, Satan thought he's Admiral Rickover. You know, he got, he got proved different, right? So anyway, uh, you've, got, you've got the God and the gods of the invisible realm, and now this conflict begins in the beginning in Eden. Eden is the abode of God and the gods, okay? As well as humans. I remember when uh, Satan talks about uh, uh, he was in Eden, you know, in the midst there, and the, the thrones of fire and all that kind of thing. So you've got, and here, come, here comes the serpent, the Nahash, the bright and shining one, okay, who rebels, and then he tempts human beings to rebel. And the most interesting thing about that whole tree of knowledge fruit thing, doesn't it look good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it tastes good, too. But you know what it can really do for you? Yep. You don't need God, because you can be a little God yourself. You know? Do you know, do you know what uh, the best definition of pride, you know, Satan's just up in his pride? The best definition of pride I ever heard was it's simply a form of self deification. Think about that for a minute. It's a form of self deification. You're not the boss of me. Yeah? I can do this without you, I don't need you. Okay? So there's where we see that first rebellion, where this conflict begins in the garden. You should be as gods. And of course there in Genesis 3.15, that's where now you've got two seeds in conflict. See the woman, see the serpent. What's the seed of the serpent going to try to do to see the woman in this warfare? Destroy it. Wipe it out. Because he already told him, it's going to bruise your head, man. You, know, you might bruise his head, it's going to bruise your head. You're going to be, that's what's going to destroy you and take away everything you think you wanted to have, okay? And so he says, I've got to get rid of that. And so he works toward that. And you, you folks, if you said your Bible at all, you know all the different ways through the seed line of the woman that, that he tries to destroy that seed line that comes down through, you know? Even to the point, was it, uh, was it old Athaliah, the queen that killed her own kids to become, <laughs> become ruler in Israel? She it destroys this, the royal seed line except for one baby got rescued. Otherwise, he almost wiped it out there. Uh, uh, the Egyptian bondage. Kill all the little boys, you know, and we don't want any meals coming. Harry did the same thing. Yeah. Two years and under, get rid of them, you know, and they escape. And so you've got all these attempts to destroy that seed line. That, that, that takes place back there in Genesis. Cain murders Abel, the second man. Anybody heard the, about the principle of the second? You ever studied the, the principle of the second, you know? Uh, the second man. Uh, Abel was that second man who was the righteous man, you know, and he gets killed. Of course, he's replaced by Seth. But then you see it wasn't Isaac. It was the second man. See? It's not the first Adam. It's the second Adam. See? And there's the principle of the second that runs through Scripture like that that God honors and, and gives his inheritance and all kinds. Because under that culture, who was to receive inheritance in any family? The firstborn, the oldest guy. Well, it doesn't always work out there the way God does things, okay? So pr pretty interesting stuff. And then uh, you, you, ha you have those four, the satanic rebellion, he, he rebels. He tempts the other humans rebel, they rebel. And then you've got the Genesis chapter 6. And this is now, this is where we get into some stuff here that people say, eh, I don't know about that. What do you mean these sons, the sons of God incursion, the satanic plot to pollute the seed line of the woman in order to destroy God's plan of reconciliation. And folks, there's, a, there's one theory out there that people hold to because they don't want to see the supernatural aspects of things. They said that was, that was the godly line of Seth cohabiting with the evil line of, 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 of daughters, of the, the, the daughters of Cain. No. <laughs> no. This is the issue of, of, of the sons of God. Who, who, those, and when you read about it, they cohabited with the daughters of man that thought they were fair, and giants came along. And after that, okay. So there, there's a there's a there's a plan, a, a plot, a a device that Satan uses to do what? 
destroy the seed line. Okay, so that happens. So there, there's your third rebellion. And then we find Genesis 11. Here comes the fourth rebellion among humanity. The, the flood comes. He gives the same mandate to Noah and so forth to go out and replenish the earth and so forth. And then lo and behold, and spread out, replenish the earth. What do they do? They gather up. Let's build a city so we can make a name for ourselves. <laughs> let's, not, let's not behold the name of God. Let's name for ourselves. And so they, they do this issue at the Tower of Babel. Well, what's God's response? Well, he confounds their language. You, you know, people talk about race. I don't, I don't even try to use the word racism anymore. Because uh, Paul tells in Acts chapter 17 that we're all one blood. There's no races, but there's tribes. Where'd they come from? Right there. <laughs> Genesis 11. God scatters them according to the language. And when you can't communicate with somebody, you go off with people that you can. And that's how your tribes and nations of people get scattered around the earth in different places. They won't do it, so he makes it happen. Okay? That's interesting, too. Uh, go over there to Genesis 11. Go to Genesis 11. I want to show this in passing. It just popped in my mind, so I don't want to forget this. Genesis 11. Thinking about this, uh, this uh, working in concert with these other sons of God and so forth that are on basically his team. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. I think that's where it is. No, let's just cut the chase here. They build the tower. Uh, and then verse 7. Go to, I will go down and there confound their language. Go to, I will go down and confound their language. What's it say? Let us. Let us go down and confound their language. You guys getting this? Yeah, you see, you see in this same stuff or am I nuts? See, <laughs> you know? And so, so there's more than just God by himself up there in the heavenly realm. He's got beings he's already created. Thrones, dominions, principalities. There's a governmental structure in the heavenly realm. Satan has rebelled, and perhaps others. By the way, you know, in this study I've done, it finally, you, you know how you believe stuff because you've heard everybody else say it before? Yeah. You know? You ever heard that thing about he took a third of the angels with him? Yes. yes. Where's that at? It ain't, it ain't there in Genesis. No, and a place that's even near is over in Revelation. It just, it don't say that. Yeah. Now, uh, do we understand from reading through Scripture that there are other demonic powers and beings and fallen sons of God and so forth that are coming along now? Satan's having an influence. He's trafficking his nonsense, okay? But uh, some of the stuff you hear, you just repeat it, and it has no basis in the Scripture. Be careful, okay? I've, I've learned that lesson a lot of times in my life. Okay, so, the, so you got those four rebellions. Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod's that person who, who's... Uh, He's, a, he's, he's, a, he's the world ruler. He's Satan's world ruler back there at the Tower of Babel. But God takes care of that and scatters him, okay? So now you've got all these languages of different people. That reminds me of Acts chapter 2. Quite all these Jews have different languages. Well, they were born in those different places. Now you've got to have a gift to be able to talk to these people in different languages. Where do them languages come from? Back here. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, and so you can see and understand as God progresses with his plan in encountering Satan's plan of evil, he has ways and means too to overcome the adversary. And through a spiritual gifting, these people in Acts chapter 2 will have the ability to speak in language, and they didn't go to language school to get it. Okay? And so I, I threw that in for free. All right. Because we're not there. All right. Here we go. Uh, let me do a couple more, and I'll quit, because, uh, and we can do some more of it tomorrow. In Genesis 11, what you saw there, he basically, when he scatters a nation, he also does something else. You don't want me? I don't want you then. Romans chapter 1. Gave him up, gave him up. Gave, when it, didn't want to contain, retain God their knowledge? Okay, fine. Go on out there. And, and he, he assigns, if you will, he puts some of these other... God's superintending those nations now. Where do you think the gods of the nations come from later on in Canaan that they're going to be in, in conflict with? And those gods also become rivals when they find out what they can do and what power they can have, apparently. Okay? But go to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 32 is a chapter that you need to study over and over again. And get a, Deuteronomy 32 sets a tone for this whole thing about 
the disinheritance of the nations by God, but then he has, he, he's going to recover those nations to himself. Remember where we started at the end? That he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and earth. Okay? He's, 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 he's just disinherited these people. And that's what we're going to find in Deuteronomy 32. But there has to come a time when he's going to recover that. Okay? And so that's what, that's what the war begins to be all about. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, you know, Genesis 10 and all that, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. How many was that? Seventy. There were 70 nations uh, that, that are Israel. Some, some people contend that should be translated like the, uh, uh, the nations or something like that, but it makes no difference. It's still 70, yeah. you know. And he says... Uh, for the, and then watch happen. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. And you, and you know the story. Out of that satanic rebellion and the scattering of the nations and so forth and the giving and disinheriting those nations, he decides he'll pick one man out of that named Abram. And he's going to be the beginning. He's going to be seed for a nation of his own. And it'll be like no other nation that ever was. And if you'll obey me, you'll be the head and not the tail. Amongst all, and you'll be greater than all the other nations out there. And you know what else I'm going to do with you? I'll use you to recover and reconcile and, and re-inherit the nations back to myself. See, that's what Israel is designed to do. That he's to be a, they're to be a tool in God's hand. Amen. They're a son with a distinct purpose, see, for God. And, and, and that, they're, they're going to be the place where he recovers things in the earth. You ever consider the question, been asked the question, what if Israel had, uh, uh, in, in, in the book of Acts, what if they had believed and received their kingdom, uh, then there wouldn't have been any need for the body of Christ, right? Sure there is. He had that figured out before the world. I still got to do somehow, some way, some way. There's going to have to be a body of Christ because I, I want people up here in the heavenly realm too. See? So don't let that throw you. Okay. So anyway, he scatters them. By language, borders, and culture, nations, he assigns the scattered nations to lesser Elohim to rule over them to prevent the recurrence of the pre-flood conditions. What happened in the pre-flood conditions? Remember the race of giants and everything? All that kind of stuff? So he, he's going to assign these to rule over the nations. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Acts chapter 17, that's where ta Paul talks about the fact that uh, we're all of one blood, that uh, through him we have our very breath and everything, you know. And so free will rebellion does not end, neither in heaven or earth. At some point, the assigned gods of the nations also become rivals of the Most High God rather than servants. Their rule becomes corrupt. Job 4.18 and 15.15, that's those verses that talk about the heavens are not clean. Okay, there's corruption there in the heavenly realm say, that happens. And so that's Psalm 82 where we were in 89. talks about that fact. He sits among the other Elohim. Go back to that with me for a minute. Go to Psalm 82 and let's read the rest of this and you'll understand that better. Psalm chapter 82. Psalm chapter 82. Psalm 82. Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, judgeth among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Who's he talking to? That congregation. It was gods in that congregation, all right? Uh, uh, and, and so he's, he says, he judges unjustly, accept the persons of the wicked. Say la. Uh, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk in darkness. All the foundation of the earth are out of course. Why aren't you guys taking care of these people like you're supposed to? Okay. I have said, you're gods, you're Elohim, and all of you are children of the Most High. Children of the Most High. God made these, okay. But you shall die like men. Well, and some people say, well, these were the rulers of Israel he's talking about here. No. <laughs> no. It, it, uh, they're going to die like men anyway. <laughs> you know, you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt what? Inherit all nations. 
Why does he need to inherit all nations? Because they've been disinherited in the first place. Okay? And he's got to do He's going to be pleased to do that through Israel. Okay? So I throw that in there. That's, 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 this, is, this is interesting stuff. Got the Lord's portion. Uh, that's, that's going to be Israel and so forth. He specifies a favored nation. God will purpose to bless all the nations who have been given up. Israel will be in covenant relationship to Jehovah. They will serve as God's mediator. Okay? Uh, to do what? To restore the nations back to himself and to reestablish a kingdom under the headship of the Messiah. Okay? There's your goal he's marching for with, with regard to the earth. There's a kingdom coming. But there's going to be some more in-between kind of bad stuff that happens before that happens, though. Okay? Jehovah's son Israel is to regard him as the God of gods and the Lord of lords. That's what those verses talk about. There is no God like unto him. There's no Lord like you. See, you're a God above all gods. See, there's many gods, but only one most high God, only one possessor of heaven and earth. And that possession has been usurped, okay? And that's what this conflict is all about. That it's an ancient adversary who wants it for himself, okay? And so we go to, let me give you one, yeah, one or two more. When you, when you study through the scripture back there about the land, the land as sacred space, a promised land for God's nation. Well, that's Canaan. But what's the problem with that place? <laughs> it's full of devils, okay? It's full of giants, full of all kinds of bad stuff, you know? It's full of Baal worshipers, see? And so now it's a stronghold, I call it, of Satan's usurped domain. And so again, remember that thing about the, the gesture of possession, you know, walking up and down in there? He, he told Abraham to do that. But that gesture that, he, that Satan had, Satan conducts that as the prince of the world. That's what he's called the prince of the world. This is mine. But then he comes along and says, Abram, you go walk up and down in that now. Okay? Because I'm going to give that to you. But the problem is, 400 years, Abraham dies and 400 years passes and then they're in captivity, his progeny. And by the time they get over there, it's full of bad stuff. Okay? Canaan land, the promised land is in there and inhabited. There are already people in the land. Okay, The promise of the land. The land is critical in your study of Israel. and that, That's their inheritance. And God gave them a land. See, A land that he's going to be pleased to dwell in. A land he's going to put his name in. He's, God's going to put his name in three places. The land, the tabernacle, and the temple. And... Uh, 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 oh, goodness. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here now. Uh, the land and, and the city, Jerusalem. The land, the city, and the tabernacle, his house. The land, city, and his house, okay? And so he makes that promise, the kingdom's coming. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel, prince with God. He wrestles with him and so forth, you know. He, he, create, he says, God must be in this place. And he raises that stone, calls it Bethel, okay? And so this land... It's to be sacred space, a holy land where Israel is destined to rule and reign with their king. Okay, Jeremiah 23. Uh, let me give you one more and I'll, and I'll quit because that's enough. Because now we're talking about the name, the name of conquest. This is very interesting. And let's do a couple of these. Go to, go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus cha or, or 3 rather, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3. And we'll, we'll make this our last slide. Exodus chapter 3. And I call this the name of conquest because this whole thing is about spiritual warfare. And, and, if, and if you study and look at this very close, you see that this is fighting language. This is war language and so forth. It goes conquest language. And so chapter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. How many people are in the bush? At least two there, isn't there? There's the angel of the Lord, <laughs> and now God's calling to him. See? You see how I'm getting this? <laughs> All right, look at, look at chapter 3 and verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. 
And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent thee unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. His name is high. Somebody quoted, I think the brother this morning quoted that thing about the only thing higher than God's name is what that he esteems? His word. Okay? But his name is critical. If, and we don't have time to do all this. Well, I'll, I'll read it real quick. That, that Exodus chapter 23, uh, he talks, again, he's talking about the angel of the Lord he's going to send before Israel. He says, my name is in him. What's that mean? The very presence of God is associated with his name. See? He will, he, his name is among Israel. See? He, when he puts, my name is in the tabernacle. See? Um, uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem is going to have my name in it. When the, when the kingdom is reestablished and Jerusalem, that harlot city, which I think is Babylon, it's, it's Jerusalem is what, I think Babylon is Jerusalem. But when that, when that city is cleansed and made right, he's going to rule there from Zion, from Jerusalem. His name is going to, his presence is going to dwell there and so forth, see. And so you've got all those promises made. He says, I am will go before the children of Israel and fight for them in the conflict with the adversary. Only he can defeat the gods of the nations as well as the giants that Moses and Joshua will find dwelling there. The name is the very presence of God. It's associated with the land. It's associated with the holy city. It's associated with the house of God. And all three of those things are going to be involved in the warfare with the prince of this world. Okay? Okay? Yeah. Now, obviously, there was a lot of verses that we couldn't get to. And so you can see, you, you go study this yourself and start to look these things up and and uh, uh, it made a difference in the excitement that I had, like I said before, of my life in Christ. Amen. Man, it's, it, uh, we're not just making a living nine to five, getting along until we die with the hope of going to heaven and sitting on a cloud strumming a harp. Even there, even there, there's a purpose for your life. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end with the mark. And I'll ask you if you remember why your life is sacred to God. Yeah. Of course, the only people whose life is sacred, because you, 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 remember, you remember Genesis chapter 5, uh, where it talks about uh, Adam, the generations after Adam. They came along in a, in a fallen Adam, and they were made in his image and likeness. Yeah. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. But if you're in Christ, you're an imager of God. You're, you're to be an imager of God with a purpose to the praise of his glory. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray and we'll move on to the next speaker. Father, we thank you so much for this time we can enjoy together just looking at these things in your word, even getting just a little taste here, Father, of uh, what you've done and accomplished, uh, your power, your majesty, your splendor, your beauty, and uh, just your wisdom that uh, outdoes everybody's wisdom, Father. We thank you for this, uh, these pleasant people here, these brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray you'll continue to give us a good time of fellowship and learning in your word and understanding. And we won't forget to give you the praise and thanksgiving for all that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right.